Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Fiona. I'm the uh, Animal Welfare and Operations Officer for Companion Animals New Zealand. Um, and we recently did a survey of companion animal guardians in New Zealand about the impacts of lockdown. Um, and we know that a lot of you guys were really worried about your animals' behaviour, both during lockdown um, and then coming out of lockdown when you started to go back to work and people have been seeing some problems. So we're really, really happy tonight to be joined by some animal behaviour consultants to help with these kinds of problems. Um, I'll welcome our behaviourists in just a second. But so you know, I'll pop in the comments in a moment a link so that if after this live stream you want to contact any of the behaviourists, um, you can go right ahead and do that. So without any further ado, let's welcome our behaviour consultants on. So first joined by Erin from Merit Dog Project in Christchurch. Hi, Erin. Hi. Hi. Good. Uh, and next up we have Maria. Hi, Hi. Maria. Hi. Hi. Auckland with Canine by Nature. Um, and also from Auckland, we have Animal Behaviour Consultant, Kelly McClellan. Hi. Hello. Hi, thank you all so much for being here. So, um, just so everyone knows the format, what we're going to do is we will have uh, about 10 minutes of each behaviour speaking um, about some common behavioural issues that are going on at the moment. Um, and then after that, we've got lots and lots of time for Q&A. The questions are welcome at any time. Uh, just pop them in the comments um, and we will um, deal with them either at the time or um, later on during the Q&A, um, depending on how we go. So we're going to start off with Maria. So I'll remove the rest of us. And Maria, you can take it away. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along tonight. And first of all, I'd like to... Um, commend you all on putting your hands up and saying you know my dog has had changes in his behavior because sometimes that's you know it's not easy to do and I just wanted to let you know that it's perfectly normal behavior is always fluid and you know we're here to help you through that so good on you um, on that line of things what I just want to um, outline first is that what we're talking about are behaviors that have presented themselves since level four since we went into level four lockdown and then moved down through level three and level two so not pre-existing behaviors um, although I will kind of just mention that briefly in a second and because of limited time and I tend to talk a lot sometimes what um, I can what I'm going to do is throw out some food for thought. I want to present to you possible reasons for the changes in your dog's behavior so that you have got something to consider, um, sit down and think about it, um, analyze what's gone on over the last few months, and um, then Erin will come on shortly and give you some ways that you can help them with that, and Kelly also. So first of all, don't underestimate the impact that the recent changes we've had here in New Zealand have on your animals. You know, we've gone from a busy world, hustle and bustle, lots of action, to silence. Nothing, no people, no dogs, no hustle and bustle overnight. No warning for our dogs. No way for them to predict what's going to happen in the world and how they should behave on it. And then we got to level two and everything came back again. Um, so depending on your own community environment, you have either been like me and gone from complete silence and quiet, or you've gone from silence to garage parties, student flats, all being at home all the time, lots of noise, and now they've all disappeared again. Either way, that's a huge amount of change, three major changes in our environment, in our lives, over the last two months. And we're not done yet. So change is stressful. And there's been a lot of it. And stress causes changes to the brain, which in turn can affect your health 
and affect the way or your dog's health and affect the way your dog views the world. And by changing the way the dog views the world, it can also change the way that they present their behaviors. In times of stress, thinking is slow. It's way too slow. The body stops thinking and goes into fight or flight mode because they just need to react to what is now. So your dog is acting on the environment through instinct, not through rational thought. Just keep that in mind as we take a quick look at what environment is. So one fabulous quote from the amazing Susan Friedman, change the environment, change the behavior. Happens without a doubt. And when I talk about environment, I'm talking about the, the, your dog's external environment. So you, home, friends, family, other dogs, the park, the beach, you know, everything that, that influences their behavior and also their internal environment. So that's how they are feeling, which is um, a little more complicated to get into so I'm not going to get into that too much aside from the stress and in a minute pain. So um, stress. Is your dog stressed by all the changes in their in their lifestyle or possibly is your dog feeding off your stress? If you've got a super sensitive dog um, and you've seen this in the past, then that can definitely be happening again. Does um, this new reactive behavior um, that started happening since you went into level two, um, sorry, I think I forgot to mention that earlier, that, that um, when we're talking about new behaviors, we, the people have written in about um, reactive behavior towards other dogs and people sorry that was um i should have mentioned that earlier so um is your dog stressed and therefore reacting is your dog um responding to your stress does um stress mean that your dog no longer has the capacity to inhibit behaviors that he used to be able to inhibit so is this something, and this is what I say, I'm not going to go into um, pre-existing behaviours too much, but is this something that was just sitting on the surface that perhaps you suspected may be there prior to lockdown, but they were able to tolerate it and move forward, and now there's just so much internal noise going on, so much change going on, that they can no longer inhibit that behaviour. Um, is, you know, stress means that um, it can affect your immune system, it can affect your dog's health, have their, you know, has that kind of gone a little bit haywire and um, allergies have re-emerged, skin sensitivities, sensitivities to food, which are just sitting there nagging at her or him and affecting their behavior. Have you been trying to help your dog since you went into level two and saw changes in your dog's behavior? Have you been trying to help them and not having much success? Stress inhibits learning. So if your dog is stressed by all the changes that have been happening, then it's going to be very difficult for you until you work with them to de-stress them to teach them um, alternative behaviours. Did you decide that now that you're in level four lockdown that you've got plenty of time and your dog can become a parkour champion? agility champion did you decide that you take them out for like four walks a day big long walks down to the local park the beach and it's proved to be just a little bit too much for that arthritis or tendonitis or old poor and your dog is experiencing pain pain is a number one contributor to um behavior and what we would label as reactivity to behavior and there's a recent study that came out in February this year that said that up to 82 percent of behavior change and um, reactive behavior have underlying pain um, has pain underlying that behavior so that will definitely be something that you want to look at 
have you changed your routine? Dogs behave, um, or they, most of them are more comfortable with a routine. What a routine means is that a dog can predict what is going to happen and they can behave accordingly. If they've had a huge change to their environment, their routine, that means that they then have to reassess what's going on, assess how the previous predictions that they made were incorrect, and then reestablish how they should behave um, in the new environment, which apparently in you know a few days or next week or whatever is going to go down another level or it's going to be more people around or something. So that's more change. Okay, just, uh, well, quite a few more to go. Um, did you, during level four, become the superstar of your dog's life? So now is your dog thinking more than before that you are the most awesome thing in the whole world and they do not want anyone else having access to you, which means they're now resource guarding you. you know, that could be a possible reason for a change in behaviour. Did the disappearance of all the people and dogs in your world and you having to take restricted regular walks all the time in the same places mean that a new territory was created for your dog? Um, and now that other people and dogs have re-emerged, they kind of feel the need to tell them to bugger off. hope I'm allowed to say that. That's technically not really swearing. Um, did your dog come into a developmental period during this stage? You know, uh, were they a puppy that come into a fair period? Have they gone into adolescence? Are they just old and grumpy and really enjoyed the peace and quiet? Which is basically just me. Um, or are they bored? Did you stay home um, at a time that you've never had before where you didn't have to do anything? So you thought you'd just sit around and play computer games and um, you didn't do as much with your dog, but that didn't matter so much because you were there with your dog um, and the company was enough. So then suddenly you go out and they see someone and they're yelling out to them in the form of barking and it makes them feel good, so they bark again. Um, but actually, Kelly's going to talk to you more about that in a minute, um, along with anxiety, another huge contributor to um, reactive behaviour. So um, loads of influencing factors on your dog's behaviour. Um, could be a combination of loads of those. Um, I'm running out of time, so I can't really give you examples of those, um, those combinations, but you can probably take a look at your own lives, what's been going on. Um, and just as I can, um, you know, explain to you that there have been many reasons for changes in behaviour at this time, um, the lovely Erin is going to come on in a minute and um, talk to you about ways that you can help address these behaviours and fun things that you can do with your dogs. So I'm going to hand over to Erin. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for having me and I'm going to start off tonight talking about play because I've had a lot of questions from people about what is appropriate when they're playing with their dog and a lot of people have been spending or have spent a lot more time with their dogs lately, which means a lot more play time. Um, which is great. It plays a fantastic way to bond with your dog. It provides exercise and it helps with boredom, of course. However, sometimes it can be really difficult to know when that play is okay and when it's not because play often mimics a lot of what we call more aggressive behaviors like growling or even biting. However, there's some key differences when we um, that we can look at to tell, if, tell us if it's play and if it's just all in fun. Um, first, when dogs play, they give us or their play partner specific signals. These are play signals. So I'll mention the most common and the most visible. Um, and the first one would be the play bow. So this is when the elbows and the, the forearms are down on the ground and the bum is up in the air. Um, also, they're going to start moving in a much more bouncy type of way, and they have a nice, loose and relaxed body. 
Um, and when two dogs are playing, we often see lots of role reversals as well. So one chases and the, then the other one is the chaser or one plays on her back and then she's the one on top. We might also see lots of bum turns where they sort of curl their body away and push their bum into their play partner. And these um, signals all indicate that play, that everything that's happening is play and that it's all play related behavior. So even when they're growling or biting, it's all just in fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's always a good idea as well to do a consent test, particularly with, when two dogs or two unfamiliar dogs are playing. If you get them to stop momentarily and they're both eager to go back at it, then it's probably, they're probably both really into it. So that's, that's a good thing to check out to make sure nobody's stressed out. And if, you know, if the dogs are at home and they're spending a lot more time together, then sometimes a younger dog can be a bit pestering to an older dog. And you just want to make sure that they're both actually really enjoying that play interaction. And even when you're playing with your dog yourself, so human, um, human dog interaction or human dog play, um, it's a good idea to do that as well. I frequently do this with my, with my dog when I'm interacting with her, whether I'm patting her or whether I'm playing with her, I will stop momentarily and I'll watch her. And if she comes back asking for more, then I know that she's enjoying that interaction. Dogs also do something that's called self-handicapping when they're playing. So this is when they make the play more even between the two play partners. So say a larger dog and a small dog are playing together. And uh, so the larger dog may lay down when they're playing with a smaller dog to be more on their level. Or, they, um, or if the play partner isn't really into that rough and tumble play, then your dog might inhibit their bite force um, or the level of intensity that, of that play session to whatever level their play partner is comfortable with. So this is a way of self-handicapping themselves to make the play more even. And they also do this with other animals, not just with other dogs. So that includes humans. They learn how much pressure is okay to use with their teeth, if any. They learn how rough they can play. Um, and this might even be different between different family members as well. I know that my dog plays with me in a particular way and with my husband in a little bit of a more rough way. <laughs> um, so when dogs are playing with people, and I do play with tug with my dog quite a lot because that's her favorite game, it's totally normal to hear growling. Um, but it's important that um, there's some rules to the game when you're playing. So when I'm playing with her, we stop when I want to stop, and she drops the item when I ask her to. So especially if she starts to get carried away, which can absolutely happen, they get really excited and their arousal levels get really high. Um, and when two dogs are playing and things get too stressful, they'll often both stop and do a whole body shake where they're kind of shaking, almost like they're shaking water off of their body. And then they go back and re-engage in the play session. So it's like a little reset. And sometimes we need that too when we're playing with our dogs. If you incorporate play into your training sessions as well, it can be a great way for them to learn impulse control. So for example, she might have to sit and stay before she gets to play tug. Um, then she has to stop and wait for the go ahead from me. So puppies are not pre-programmed to have impulse control. So it's something that they learn through their engagement with others and something that we should definitely work on with our dogs. So play can be a really beneficial way to teach our dogs what's appropriate. So this leads me into enrichment. So now that we're in level two, many of us have returned to work or are away from the house more often or away from our dogs more often. And this means less walks and probably less playtime as well. So it's, our, it's important that our dogs have lots of mental stimulation um, to make sure that they're not bored. Um, enrichment, which is the, is, is the process of making um, our dog's living space 
um, interesting and stimulating. So it decreases boredom and those subsequent problems that come with boredom, um, such as maybe destroying your furniture or digging holes in the garden. Um, enrichment should include a variety of options. So just providing one or two puzzle toys isn't really enough. They're great, don't get me wrong, but they're not enough. So think about um, all the things that your dog likes to do naturally. They like to sniff and dig and chase and search and forage. So allowing your dog to have an appropriate outlet for these behaviors can actually decrease unwanted behaviors like digging in the garden or destroying the furniture. So enrichment might look like a sandbox full of dirt where you bury treats and allow your dog to dig. Um, it might be using a flirt pole, which is like a long fishing rod looking item with a tug toy at the end to allow for chase games. It might be a variety of food dispensing toys or puzzle toys that allow your dog to use their brain power or foraging skills to get the treats. And this is also really self-reinforcing. They're getting a food reward for being calm and self-entertained, which is good. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money either. Just Google DIY dog enrichment or join some of the dog enrichment groups on Facebook. Um, there's going to be ample examples of how to make your own enrichment. I personally, or I guess all of my, do my dogs have personally really liked the find it game. So I hide treats around the house and the yard while my pup waits. And then I tell her, go find it. I don't want to say that too loud. She's probably listening. Go find it. <laughs> and it keeps her busy for like a good hour. Um, my dog also really loves to rip up cardboard. So filling a box or an empty paper or towel roll with treats and letting her rip it up is a super fun activity. It's a bit of cleanup, but that's okay. It's worth it. Um, also, think about your dog's different senses. So your dog's primary sense of is their sense of smell. Um, and that's a main way that they gather information about their environment. So going for a sniffing walk in new places can be really enriching for your dog. And if they can't be off lead because of laws or restrictions or because they aren't sociable or are not reliable when they're recalled, you can use a long line to allow them to have more freedom, which could help them decompress from any stress as well um, that they're experiencing. So by going to new places, your dog gets to see and hear and experience all sorts of new things as well. And unlike us, dogs only get to go out and experience the world when we're there to take them. So even several short walks a day can be great boredom busters. Um, I actually prefer, like, if I'm not going for a hike that day, which I often do, but if I'm not, um, I prefer going for some, sh like, several short walks a day rather than one, you know, long walk in the morning. Um, that just kind of breaks the day up a little bit more. And, you know, if your schedule permits that type of um, walking schedule, um, that's an ideal way to do it. Um, so another um, one that we often don't think of is clicker training. So clicker training is a great way to enrich your dog's mind. Um, teach them a new skill, a new trick or, you know, something like that. And it's a really good way to um, build a bond with your dog as well. Um, and this can be just as tiring as going out and playing fetch or going for a run at the park. Um, Learning takes a lot of brain power. And as a PhD student, I can attest that I get actually more tired sitting at my desk reading and writing than I do after a three hour hike with my dog. Um, so your dog is the same. So think of ways that um, your dog can keep busy with something appropriate and prep ahead of time. So I keep my freezer loaded with stuffed Kongs. I have a variety of puzzle toys in it that I rotate through. I use their snuffle mat at dinner um, or slow feeder. 
And um, again, I make sure that she gets out for a minimum of two walks a day, even if it's 10 minutes around the block and she spends five of that sniffing one bush, then that's fine. <laughs> So um, now I'm going to pass you over to Kelly, who's going to talk about um, barking and anxiety and those types of behaviors that um, might be cropping up. Thank you. And um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here and to see you all this evening. Well, actually, I can't actually see or hear you, but um, from some of the comments I saw, I know that some of you are there. I want to talk about barking. It certainly is, uh, for many owners, a dreaded complaint. Everyone dreads the noise complaint, potentially from the council or even their neighbor. But the first thing to realize with barking is it's actually a very, very normal behavior. We do see it sometimes as a nuisance and, oh, you know, we want the dog to just stop. But the reality is the dog is actually trying to communicate with you. It is a form of communication, just like me chatting away. Sometimes, um, you know, for, for people, we vocalize with regards to shouting. We might scream. Uh, we laugh. We um, chat. All these are communications. Um, and so really, really important to remember that for our dogs. Also as well, when it comes to barking, there's actually many reasons why the dog barks. For some dogs, it's just the fact, um, as Erin's been talking about, it can be boredom. Um, also with regards to Maria touching on about stress and reactivity. We've also got even excitement, you know, the dog's reacting because it's excited it's seen another dog. It's not always a fear-based um, reaction. And then we get things, especially around the property. So it could be a territorial behavior. It could be a guarding behavior. So it's really important, again, to start being aware of what actually is causing this dog to bark and not to just look at the problem and go, I just want it to stop, which is usually what many people do. But the reality is once we start looking at why the dog's barking, it's actually easier to, to start to then minimize it. So if we look at it in a simple term, for example, a dog um, is at home, is out in the garden, pottering around, and he can see people wandering past the property. And that dog now has decided, well, I've got to alert everybody in the house that there is someone nearby and therefore a potential danger. And so the dog will start to bark. Now, for the dog, because it can see the people, the people then, of course, continue on with their walk, minding their own business, who are actually no threat at all to um, the dog or the property, and therefore they continue walking on. However, for the dog, it's actually starting to learn that the behavior it's displaying with regards to barking and trying to chase these people away is actually working. So therefore now it becomes more repetitive. So when we look at dogs, for example, like this, then the aim is that we have to, number one, potentially reduce the visual that it has of people moving past, past the property. We know many dogs sometimes like to even sit on the couch in the house and look out through the window. And of course, what do they do? They bark at people passing by. It might be that we have to restrict their access outside to stop them from running up to the gates or to the busier areas of the property outside, especially if you live, you know, where you're back onto a park or there's a, a walkway nearby. So it really is about, first of all, looking at the management of that behavior and how can we minimize it? It's not about just making it stop because the dog will naturally bark. And certainly more so if the opportunity is there um, and presents itself. So one of the questions I tend to get is more of, you know, when would the council think barking is a problem? And in all honesty, it's quite a difficult one to um, say. And the reason for that is because we all have our own idea of what we would class as nuisance barking as a neighbor. And so, you know, for many people, it could be, you know, the dog just barks a couple of times and they're already sick of hearing it and they want it to stop. Um, but usually I tend to say it's becoming quite abnormal when that particular dog is barking continuously all day and especially when it's been left alone. Because that then tells me that specifically for that dog, it is starting to struggle with being alone. Now, certainly since we've had um, COVID-19 and we've been going through lockdown, 
Certainly now since moving into level two, many owners that have contacted me have been telling me that they are concerned about their dog and its barking behavior. And they've seen a huge increase um, in this behavior itself, even while the dog is in the home, not just outside. So a few scenarios that we can look at. So one um, is dogs that are displaying hyperattachment issues. And this is where, for example, the owner could be in the house, but the dog now is starting to bark and whine. Some are howling, some are scratching at the door when the owner is on the other side of the door. So they're not in the same room as the dog. And the dog's actually really now struggling with that separation. And you have to remember that since the COVID-19, even as Maria um, mentioned earlier, you know, dramatic changes have happened not just for us, but also for our dogs as well. And literally overnight in a 24 hour period, we've gone from, you know, being at work full time, having our regular routine to all of a sudden being at home for hours on end, 24 seven. And don't get me wrong, our dogs have probably really enjoyed this. We have them, they're our companion animals. And we want, you know, we have them because we want to share our life with them. But for many dogs now, since coming into level two, it's now starting to display that they're actually struggling with us starting to add some of this back to um, normality in our life. Because now many people have to do the school run. They're taking the children um, to school in the morning, picking them up. They might be running errands. Um, some people are going back into the workplace as well. So certainly for our dogs in the home with hyperattachment issues, this has already now started to display out and they're really struggling. Um, and then on the other side of that, we also have the dogs who, again, may not have been suffering any form of separation issues prior. Um, but now the minute they're left alone and the owners are completely gone, the dog is now barking. They could be um, displaying destructive behaviours. They are certainly howling and, um, and some are actually escaping from the properties as well. And these were potentially dogs that prior to the COVID lockdown were absolutely fine. They could cope on their own. They were happy outside in the garden. They weren't barking all day or for hours on end. They were actually quite happy doing their thing and enjoying themselves. They could have been relaxing outside. Um, some of them were coping inside. And for many people, you know, they could actually um, even be in another room away from their dog. And the dog was absolutely fine about it. So, we have to be realistic when we do look at, at barking behaviours and understand that it is part of an issue. And we always have to figure out what that greater issue is. So for many dogs who, as I say, have been suffering with things like hyperattachment, this is actually certainly a, a common problem. I've started to see in young puppies that were um you know, purchased during the COVID lockdown. And now, you know, they've gone from someone always being there to now literally not there anymore. And they've really started to struggle as well with people being in another room because being aware for many, they've gone into a household with um, family members. And now all of a sudden, many family members are out and about during the day. So for some owners, they're even struggling, whether it be just a take a shower in peace because the dog wants to be in there with them and is is barking or or you know as I say um scratching at the doorway trying to push the door open because it really really wants to be with them so for those dogs um we need to look at ways to help them starting to cope alone so the first thing is you know we could look at um teaching them that actually being on their bed and not being sat right next to me is okay and helping them to relax it might be that we pop a baby gate between um us and them between a room so if we if you are working from home your dog doesn't get full access to you all the time but they can still see you and then gradually we will start to then add on plans to help that dog with the door closed and settling on their bed and not panicking that you're not right next to them. For dogs, however, that are suffering, suffering with um, isolation distress issues. So that means when the owner um, or family members have all left the dog and they've all gone out and that dog now is completely left alone. The first thing for those particular dogs is we tend not to recommend confinement. So don't crate them. It seems to be uh, one of those things that's advised to many people, but it's actually detrimental to that dog. So do not confine them. If that dog is really stressed, 
Max being left alone and is having a panic attack, then um, confining that dog will make it worse. Secondly, we find as well many dogs who are suffering with separation don't do well outside. So you may have the best uh, best back garden in the world for them but the reality is they won't really want it they'll struggle being out there and again it's very then easy for them to escape so recommendation is to keep them in the home if you can and then what we also need to do for those dogs is to then set up a desensitization plan to start helping them learn that the triggers of us leaving and what I mean by that is picking up keys and um, you know getting in the car doesn't always mean that we're going to leave them so the one thing I do advise that you must never, ever do is to let the dog go what we call cold turkey. So basically, we know it's struggling being on its own, but oh, well, I'll just keep doing that and the dog will get used to it. Sadly, that is not the case. And many of these dogs need help. Um, so again, please don't do that. Um, but otherwise, you know, for, for many of these dogs, um, as I say, we can set up really good plans for them. We can start to help them relax. And, um, and again, if we add in that desensitization plan, then we can start to reduce any feeling they have of anxiety and therefore reduce any barking. And of course, no more noise complaints. Thanks very much, Kelly. So we're going to go into some questions now. I'm going to bring everybody back. Hi, everyone. Hi. So the first question I have, so I've been collecting these questions from different sources, is the suggestion that somebody made that if they have a dog who isn't coping very well with everybody moved, um, gone back to work, the suggestion that they should go out and buy a second dog. What do you guys think of that suggestion? Any advice for that person? Really? Uh, <laughs> uh, my answer to that is no. Uh, reason being that we actually do know, and as far as I'm aware, I'm not sure if Erin will be able to uh, back me up on this as well, but I think there are some studies out there as well that do show purchasing the second dog, bringing the second dog home doesn't actually help these dogs with separation issues. And worst case scenario, you could end up with also kind of double the trouble as well because you never quite know if the other dog could also have um, possible issues that are brewing. So no, I, I definitely don't recommend that at all. The dog does need to learn um, by us setting up plans to help them to cope being alone. I think in addition to that too, I totally agree with Kelly. Um, in addition to that too, the second dog can also get very stressed out being around another dog that's mm. feeling that anxious yeah. and stressed. Good, thank you. I hope that person didn't run out and buy a dog before he <laughs> <laughs> uh, So another person that I actually know personally is having an issue since lockdown. Um, we, you know, they used to get people coming into their house all the time. Then of course they had nobody coming into their house for about two months. And um, their dog is now being quite aggressive towards visitors in a way which is unpleasant, not to mention embarrassing for that person and unpleasant for the dog, I should say. What advice do you have? So by aggression, I mean um, growling at those visitors and sort of trying to herd them out, no biting or anything. Shall I take the lead on that one? Yeah, I think Maria. Um, so going back to what I was saying and um, really with this, we like to be able to see the behaviour in action so that we can um, operationalise, we call it, what it looks like. But um, the resource guarding now, you know, if they have, if they were used to sharing their family and but now they've had exclusive um time with their family and other people are coming in then they may not want that kind of exclusive time um set up uh, potentially it could be territorial um if that is any kind of behavior that may have shown itself before um again it could be pain related um it could be and if you do you know the dog Fiona? Uh, yes, a little bit. 
and it does have a history of um, resource guarding. Right. Other resources. Okay. okay. So that so that probably does. The other thing I was going to say is if um, yeah, if you if you know the dog, if they have any, if they were potentially wary of people before, but it was okay, you know, they could tolerate meeting them and quite enjoyed it. The time away from them, that kind of use it or lose it, um, may have happened. But in this case, potentially, it is the resource guarding. So, should this person continue to have people come into the home, or should he keep people away for a while? This what this person should do is contact I think one of us or another professional because what you want that behavior really analyzed so that we can say yes you know this does look like resource guarding and then put some protocols in place. Generally um, the rule is resources are, um, are deemed as valuable when they are or are perceived to be scarce. You know, like toilet paper and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so, so what we want to do is um, teach the animal that it's not scarce and that, you know, anyone else coming into the environment does not mean that their access to those, um, that the prior, their priority access to those kind of very important people is not going to be threatened. It's, it's, there's quite a lot in it. Um, I don't want to just kind of throw too much out there in a live talk in case, um, you know, anyone tries to just go and do that. Is that okay? Fair enough. <laughs> so for somebody who is having a problem with a barking dog and has a complaining neighbour, what advice can you guys offer for dealing with that neighbour? Like, nobody wants to have an unpleasant thing and nobody wants, if you're trying to deal with your barking dog, it's not something you can just go, oh, fix that. Do you guys recommend that you communicate with the neighbour or is it better to put the dog inside? If, it, if something needs to be done straight away, what advice can you guys give around that and around dealing with the neighbour? Are we, sorry, are we, sorry. Yeah, I was just about to say, are we talking about if the neighbour has complained or just the fact the that... neighbour's complained, doing? and I know that it's, you know, Mr Smith next door, he's never liked the dog, and he's yell, always yelling at it over the fence. So shut up. Go on, Erin, I'll let you go for this one first. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> take the dog out of that environment, especially when you're not around to supervise. Um so if you're not home, not leaving them out in the yard is definitely the best option for um, an immediate reprieve. <laughs> um, and, you know, not allowing visual access either. So closing curtains or putting up barriers or putting frost on the windows so that they can't see um, that neighbor or and or leaving um, white noise on depending on what's you know triggering the barking as well if it's the sound of the neighbor doing something um you know white noise might help as well if this is when you're not there um i mean i think it would depend on the person if they wanted to talk to their neighbor or not i don't know if i would want to confront an angry neighbor necessarily but at the same time i think it would be a nice, um, you know, just to acknowledge that you're working on it and it's something that is going to take some time, but um, that you're doing everything that you can at this time to to mitigate the problem and, and you know, not and to prevent any further barking while you're not at home to be able to control the situation. Yeah, I was going to say just on that as well, um, sometimes what I've advised in the past depends on the neighbour. You know, some people have great relationships with them. Some people just don't really know them or they've not had the best experience with them. But um, in the past, I have said that, you know, you can always leave a really nice friendly note to say that you're aware of this issue now. Because also you have to remember, we how do we know what's going on when we're not there? Yeah. We can't hear the dog. You know, we do not have supersonic hearing as much as we'd love to. We don't. And we do have to be told by somebody 
what is happening when we're not around. And for many owners, they're absolutely distraught when they find out that, you know, their dog has potentially been barking all day or there's certain things happening. So I usually say if you can, you know, even just leave a friendly note in the letterbox for the neighbor just to tell them, hey, look, we're going to address this now. This is what we're dealing with. And I have had people even leave my card in there to say if the neighbor wants to contact me directly, I'm fine for them to speak to me. Um, if, if that's the way for, for them to, you know, find a solution, I guess. <laughs> and also, um, I have on occasion um, had the client get the neighbour involved in the solution. So, you know, as Kelly was saying, thank you for letting me know. I didn't know. And if you could text me when it's happening, if you could take notes of when it happens, if it's just when the courier comes, but then my dog doesn't stop, then that gives me information to work with. And, um, you know, and you're letting your neighbor know that you hear them and, um, and can they help? That's a really good point, actually, Maria. The, um, the relationship with the neighbor could turn into a valuable, like an asset in trying mm -hmm. to uh, fix it if, if handled right and the neighbors cool about it. Really? Um, a follow-up question on something you said, Erin, white noise. What counts as white noise? Is it TV or radio or does it have to be like static? Um, I, I like the TV personally for my dog because that's something that's comfortable for her because the TV's on a lot in our house. So um, it's just something that is comforting for her and it helps to just drown out background noise and she's a bit sensitive to outside noises. So it really helps her, especially when I'm not here. Um, but whatever, you know, if, if you're used to listening to music and that's what your dog is used to, um, there's been studies to show that classical music is can be soothing. There's also, um, there's CDs that you, or I don't know if CDs, but like um, MP3s that you can purchase that are um, specific for dogs um, to listen to. Um, that is supposed to be, you know, help to create a calm environment for them. I have one last question, which is around dogs on leashes. Um, so if a dog is because hasn't been off leash and is now starting to get a bit reactive to other dogs when they're walking past, but used to be fine with other dogs. Kate, is there any kind of generic advice you can give towards that problem or what might be happening there? Uh, can I just kick off with feed, feed, feed? <laughs> and um, this actually happened to my dogs during level four. Uh, well, actually one of them the little one, which is, you know, silly for an Italian greyhound. But she just decided that she was going to lunge and bark at um, other dogs when we saw them because seeing dogs became really novel. And this was a brand new behaviour. So we had a new rule in our house, which was every time you, when we're out, every time you see a person, you got a treat or the dog's got a treat. And every time you saw another dog, they got like three so um, what we're doing is we are, um, and the others will probably like smile at this, because what we are doing is addressing their, by giving them uh, an unconditioned stimulus, a primary reinforcer, the technical terms, but food, something that is vital for life, we're addressing their emotional feel, response to seeing another dog. We are not reinforcing the barking. So that is because I can kind of see comments coming in. <laughs> no, I can't literally see comments coming in, but you know, people are like, oh, I'm not gonna, you know, like, give my dog a treat for barking, he's just gonna keep barking, but it goes deeper than that. So, um, and the, the barking, as Kelly was talking about, could potentially be just, you know, and you need to see it because is it just like frustration? that I'm on a lead and now I want to get access. So it's the, the dog is frustrated at the lead that is, is, is keeping him back. Is the dog suddenly resource guarding? Um, is the dog barking? Because actually they're just really happy and they're just really noisy to see. You know, there's a number of reasons for it, but I would, if I was addressing it, absolutely start by, oh, cool, there's a dog, get some food. That's really good advice. 
I'm going to take this chance to cheekily ask a question about my own dog, um, so since you're all here. <laughs> um, so when we put my dog outside, um, she's really good about being out there on her own. But when she wants to come back in, sometimes she starts to whine, let me in at the door. And we never let her in when she's currently whining because we don't want to encourage that. But how long after the whining is it okay to let her in? Well, can I, like, is one minute enough? <laughs> 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 and then you have a kind of time. Yeah. 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 Why aren't you letting her in when she's letting you know she needs to come in? I would like, always her encourage her to cry. <laughs> Just let her in. I would let her in. That won't encourage her to cry more as soon as she wants to be let in. No, but no, she's what? telling you she wants to come in. Yeah, she's telling you she wants to come in. If if what you do by listening to her is create, we all feel really bad because it's you, Fiona, and we're like going, whoa, Fiona, <laughs> let your dog in. But no, this is good. Create a dialogue. And your dog will learn that if she talks, if she communicates with you, you're going to listen. And okay. that, and that's a huge. So then, um, you know, and commu a dialogue is the most important thing we can have with our dogs. Uh, well, so. I'm really glad I asked because somebody else, yeah. not a behaviorist, taught me to do that. So I can't be the I, only one. No. <laughs> I was going to say, I was just going to say as well, when, you know, when we look at dogs or they're, they're wanting something, um, and certainly when they're vocalizing, many times we as people see this as like a, a bad thing and that, oh, that must stop before the dog is allowed this. But it really, and that's why I was saying it depends because it really depends on the scenario. So, you know, why is the dog whining? Is the dog whining to come in? Is it become a learned behavior? Um, does the whining now go up for longer because the dog's figured out, well, I've got to whine to get in and you're not listening. So now I've got to keep doing it for, you know, two minutes, five minutes, whatever. So, so yeah, so let, let her in. <laughs> we have a um, no. If you don't like the whining, is you could teach her to knock or something. I don't know. Teach her an alternative yeah. behavior to let you know that she wants to come in. Oh. Or just leave the door open. Oh, I'll just let her in now. <laughs> just let her in. I have, my, I think, a related question here, um, which I will pop up on the screen from Rachel. So I think she means about vocalizing for puppies in a crate. That's, that's how I've taken that to me. Yeah, I, was gonna say, I have a real issue with people leaving their puppies crying in a crate. I have a real problem with that personally because, again, the puppy is telling you it's not happy. Um, now, don't get me wrong, sometimes, you know, they might first go in their crate and they might have a minute or so being a little bit upset and then all of a sudden they just settle down, they'll go to sleep or they'll chew their toy. But, you know, many people start to leave their dogs 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes crying, like really crying. And sadly, it's because, you know, when I've spoken to them about what's happening, you know, they've they've read somewhere that um, you leave the dog until it stops and then finally you let it out. Otherwise, it'll learn that, um, you know, the crying kind of works. But the reality is the, do the dog's in distress. It's upset. So, um, yes, I as soon as I have a puppy start crying, I let it out. It's telling me it's not coping. Mm. I totally agree. And I think, too, um, I mean, puppies aren't um, immune to separation anxiety related behaviors either. So um, I think we have to be very careful. And I think that it's kind of outdated advice to just let your puppy cry it out. Mm -hmm. And it's better if we want to crate train them to do it um, in baby steps where they're never feeling stressed and we make it a really pleasant, happy environment for them where they're never getting to a point where they're so distressed that they're you know, crying and, and asking to be let out. Right. Thank you. I think that's really helpful <laughs> for me and for Rachel and then hopefully for everyone else watching. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now because it's been almost an hour. Um, but thank you guys so much for this. Um, and, yeah, if anyone wants to contact uh, Kelly or Erin or Maria, 
um, in the comments I've put how you can um, how you can get a hold of them. But thank you both so much. Brilliant. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.